What is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Crypto Entrepreneurs Podcast. As always, it's your host, Charles, and today we've got another really exciting episode for you. So I'm going to be sitting down with Digital Tom. He is the host of the DYOR podcast, the Do Your Own Research podcast. He has a very similar background to myself. He's got a background in finance, was working at Ernst & Young. Uh, he was working actually in their blockchain department or with the blockchain group. Uh, and so today we sit down and we talk about that. We also talk about what it means to actually do your own research. And then we really get into his podcast who he's had on, what he talks about. Uh, it's a wonderful episode. But before we get into that, two quick things. The first is this is another video interview. After this little intro, we will jump into it. You'll get to see his face. Uh, and if you're listening to this on any of the podcasting platforms, I highly suggest heading over to YouTube. There's a link in the description below. It'll take you right to the video. You can watch along as we talk. I think it's a lot more fun when you do this instead of just sitting down and listening to it you get to put a face to the name and the voice so head on over the second thing is i do want to give a huge shout out to the sponsors i feel like every time i talk about these guys every single week there's something new the first is crypto.com these guys are making leaps and bounds they are at the forefront of this industry in case you missed it on twitter they are the second hashtag or second crypto hashtag to get their own little emoji. When you hashtag them, their little logo comes up. I tweeted about it. You guys have to check it out. It's the second after Bitcoin, and it is unbelievable that these guys are sponsoring my podcast. A uh, couple other announcements. Uh, just a quick reminder with that Visa MCO credit card. The crypto credit card that I've been talking about that you need to go get. Uh, you can add it to your Google Play, your Samsung, your Apple wallets. Uh, so you can use them, use it to pay very easily. Two more token sales are coming up on the 23rd through the syndicate. They're doing a 25% off sale for Engine, which means that they allocate a certain amount, a certain dollar amount for this one. It's 250 grand. And everyone who participates gets their engine 25% off. And that's on the 23rd. And then on the 30th for their fourth anniversary, they're actually doing a Bitcoin sale. Uh, it's half off Bitcoin. You don't need to be holding any CRO. You just participate in it. You get your Bitcoin 50% off. If you're not participating in this token sale, I'm sorry, but you hate money. You don't want to get this Bitcoin 50% off. Um, so those are kind of the big updates, I would say, from Crypto.com. Again, huge shout out to them. If you haven't checked them out yet, there's a, a link in the description below. Highly encourage you to do so before this episode. And then the second is CoinFlip, the largest crypto ATM company by, by volume and the third largest by number of machines. I picked them up as a sponsor about a month ago. And so far, it's been wonderful. If you haven't checked them out already, there's a link in the description below. It'll take you to their website. As I said, third largest by number of machines. On their website, you can see where every single one is. Find the one that's closest to you. And you can head out and make that first Bitcoin purchase through an ATM if you haven't already. It's a great experience. I highly encourage you to do it. And with the code CHARLES, you will get 20% off fees, which is just another added incentive to go check out one of these machines. And then one more big announcement from them is their OTC desk. I have been talking about this for a month. It is now up and running, has gone over, the launch has gone over smoothly. A uh, couple huge things about them. They have some of the lowest fees for OTC desks on the market. So if you're looking to pick up some Bitcoin over the counter, you can head over. They also have extremely low minimums. It's a $5,000 minimum, whereas most OCT, OTC desks sorry, are you know six figures minimum. Uh, so if you're looking to pick some up, again, there's a link in the description below. You can head on over, check it out, learn about how it works, and buy some Bitcoin over the counter. 
Again, I always apologize for the length of these. These guys are huge. They've got so many announcements to talk about. But now let's get into the episode with Tom. Talk about his podcast and doing your own research. Uh, so Tom, I, I want to thank you for sitting down with me today. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to this episode a lot. Um, do want to get into your podcast, your previous work, all of that. Uh, but before we do get into all of that stuff, do you think you could just give us quick background on yourself, what you were doing before you got into this industry, uh, before you learned about blockchain technology and Bitcoin, uh, just so we can get an idea of who you are. Yeah, for sure, man. And I appreciate you taking the time to have me even on the show. It's a, it's an honor. So, I'm stoked. um, yeah. Um, you know, my background was I went to, um, I'm from New York. I went to a state university of New York school, um, SUNY Albany. So I graduated from, undergrad 2013 in 2014 I, for some reason i wanted to get my master's in tax i was going to go down the cpa route um awful idea but <laughs> after i graduated i was like shit like you know this is reality now like i'm not a student anymore i'm going to be an employee and i've always heard like you know miserable things about being an employee and i'm sure you could attest to that uh, you know with your background um so i'm i the social network had happened to come out at that point. I'm watching it. Um, I learned about the Winklevoss twins and you know how they win all this money from the settlement. I was like, what, whatever happened to these guys? So I start digging into their backgrounds a little bit and I see that they uh, took a bunch of their money and they put it into this thing called Bitcoin. I was like, all right, well, you know, these guys seem like they're a lot smarter than me. Let me start looking into it a little <laughs> bit. Um, so back then, you know, the, the information on, on the internet wasn't all that great at that time. Um, so I'm trying my best to under, understand this stuff, but it just wasn't clicking for me. So once I started learning about mining, it went just straight over my head. And I was like, all right, I, I put this to bed. You know, Bitcoin was probably around like in the 200 range at, at that point. Um, I, I didn't think about it. So I, I start working at Ernst & Young uh, for the first two years I'm there. Uh, my background's in securitization. So all those mortgage-backed securities and all that terrible stuff that happened in 2008, 2009, I'm working on that at this accounting firm. Um, and I get promoted in towards the end of 2016. And I have to go to Connecticut for a training. So they're like, hey, you know, there's a couple of classes being offered. Which ones do you want? And there's this one about Bitcoin and blockchain. I was like, all right, I keep hearing about this thing. Let me learn about it. And then subsequently, like right before I go to that training um, in the World's Wall Street Journal, there's this article talking about how Bitcoin's market capitalization is getting overtaken by altcoins. So I'm like, all right, this thing keeps popping up, popping up. There's something to it. Uh, so I, I get to the training. I'm talking to this um, manager who's in the blockchain group there, and he does an excellent job at explaining it to me. And I was just hooked from there. So I, I linked up with him um, a few weeks after that training. You know, he starts talking to me about some of these altcoins. Um, I'm watching everything that I can possibly on YouTube, trying to learn as much as I possibly can about blockchain technology, Bitcoin, and then all these altcoins. And I decide with one of my friends, let's start mining Ethereum. Um, so back then, you know, you, you get a rig up. I had no idea how to build a computer or anything like that, but um, we figured it out. We built a mining rig. And from there, it was just continuous. Uh, you know, we just started building a, a few more rigs. We started speculating, I guess you can call it, on some of these altcoins. We got lucky on, on some of them during this um, ICO craze of 2017. And, you know, I was just hooked from there. That's amazing to hear. We have very similar backgrounds. I was working a finance position straight out of college. I was working as a credit analyst or an underwriter. Uh, and like you were kind of saying, the the desk job nine to five finance was just I hated it you know and I uh, needed to get away from it pretty interesting that uh, your job actually offered these classes and you got to learn about it through your job uh, my bank was uh, I'd say a dinosaur and they weren't even thinking about anything like this I, I know one person who was talking about Bitcoin and that was in 2017 during the crazy like I bought some I made some money that was pretty much it mm -hmm. other than that the bank was completely against it uh, what was it like in the, cause you were working, did, how long did you stay there after that training uh, before you decided, you know, your time, time was up there? Uh, so I, I literally just left um, EY a few months ago. Okay. Um, so you, have you been yeah. working in their quote unquote blockchain department for, for the last, I guess, two years or so, three years? 
Uh, yeah, so I've had a ton of experience there and, you know, I'm so grateful for that because I've been able to work on some engagements that I never would have had the opportunity to do elsewhere. Yeah, and right. learning, yeah, I mean, learning about the technology firsthand. And like, you know, I'm not really a techie guy. I, I understand a lot of this stuff and like it's, it's a passion of mine. Um, I like seeing like how these new technologies can change the workforce and optimize businesses and stuff like that. But if you ask me to sit behind a computer and start coding, like I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, so, you know, being able to get like business experience in the blockchain group was unbelievable. So um, I'm there, you know, I get promoted uh, two years after two years. I start talking about this guy. Maybe it was uh, two and a half, three years. I forget what it was now. Uh, everything's blurring together at this point. But right. uh, uh, yeah, fast. It's, <laughs> it's been a crazy few years, man. Um, but I, I'm working with this guy and he's like, I'm like, listen, you know, th this is awesome. I want to start working for you. And he's like, all right, cool. Let's see what we could do. Uh, literally a couple of weeks later, he was like, you work in securitization, right? And I'm like, yeah. He was like, we just had a bank reach out to us that focuses in securitization and they want some type of use case using blockchain. I was like, fucking A. So I'm sorry, am I allowed to curse on this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was like, yeah, man, that's fucking sick. So I, um, I, I start building this deck with him about the different use cases that they could use within the securitization industry. My partner gets involved. I get him hooked on uh, blockchain tech and Bitcoin. Uh, we're going back and forth. And then ever since that, like in my particular group at the time, I was known as a blockchain guy. So anytime they wanted to do some presentations about securitization and the future of blockchain, this, that, or another thing, I was the go-to person. And then I was starting to get looped in more and more and trained more and more by the actual blockchain team itself. So I didn't even realize that like a couple of years before that, there was a dedicated blockchain team who's been working on this stuff for, for a few years at that point. So I feel like I'm behind the curve. I'm trying to learn this stuff. They're talking about Ethereum. I'm like, this is sick. Like, you know, I don't know the coding language, but they're trying to like exploit it in any way possible and use like it for the future of building all these texts that they're working on. Um, so I get looped in. Um, I got certified to be a scrum master. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's essentially like managing a lot of like these, the development team and making sure like there's no hind hindrances like in their way um, to allow them to build out the tech and then, you know, manage everything accordingly. I, I worked on a bunch of like blockchain use cases and stuff like that. One of my favorite projects that I was on um, while I was there was around syndicated loans. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I had no idea what it was beforehand. Yeah, we had, we had a small little syndications team in our bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, for the audience who might not know um, what that is, um, I like to explain it as if, let's just say Disney World um, you know, or Disney, you know, they go to a bank and they say, hey, we want to build another theme park. Uh, it's going to cost us, um, I don't know, let's just say $10 billion. The bank's like, cool, um, you know, you're a reputable, you know, borrower, so we'll give you the money, but it's too risky for us to just hand you over 10 billion. So we're going to divide that out amongst like a, a pool of people. So they'll become what's known as like the, the lead runner or the runner of the uh, transaction. And they'll put together this proposal. They'll say, Hey, Disney wants to uh, borrow $10 million. Um, if you're interested in participating in it, you make whatever amount of interest it is over X amount of time. And a bunch of people will start participating in that. But the thing is, as like the runner bank that's coordinating this entire transaction, they're responsible for managing all like the monthly like principal and interest payments and keeping track of all this stuff. So we're called in by this massive bank, like one of the largest banks in the world. Everyone knows about them. And they're like, we're still using fax machines to try and like, you know, get a lot of our stuff done. Like a lot of this stuff is just sitting in drawers somewhere. Like we have no idea how to keep record of this. And it's a fucking nightmare trying to keep track of like who's owed what and like where the payments are going and things like that. So we're like, this is awesome. Um, so we're, we're going, we build like the, the minimum viable product. We're building some use cases to, to show to them. They love it. Um, but it's just like stuff like that, that EY is working on that I was able to be a part of. That was just so cool to get that experience firsthand. Yeah, man, it's it's pretty crazy to talk to you because you think about some of the people who are kind of at the forefront of this industry and some of these major corporations, a huge accounting firm, tax firm, uh, they're kind of leading the way in some in some areas and you're kind of leading the team in this section in the blockchain group or at least leading a team. Uh, so, you know, you were really at the forefront of this. You're learning a lot. What made you want to kind of leave that and do your own thing, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, listen, um, it was an incredible experience. But at the end of the day, 
you know, you get, you get a handful of projects, right? Um, this is something that's been talked about for the past couple of years is that like adoption just isn't coming. And it's not with cryptocurrencies. Um, I mean, it is with cryptocurrencies, but it's also with blockchain technology. Um, if it's a lot, a lot of people want to say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And these banks have been operating for the same way for 50, 60 years, whatever it was. I mean, less than that, but um, they're so used to their processes and they'll manage all these headaches and the idea of like uprooting their, their technology and their systems and stuff like that, uh, it scares the living shit out of them. So you don't get these high paying clients coming in wanting to do these projects all the time. So eventually they're like, Hey, you know what? We're not able to support you. Um, you know, working on business cases because there's no business cases for us to do right now. So you could continue getting some experience here and working for us, but you also have to continue working on the securitization side as well. And I'm like, man, this shit is so boring. Like it, it was like a tease, right? Like I'm getting all this experience. I'm getting hyped about it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, you kind of have to split your, your time. You like pull 50, you back 50. a little bit. They're going to rein exactly. you in. Yeah. So I'm like, man, you know what? Screw it. Let me go somewhere else where uh, it might not be blockchain specific, but it's still working with like a lot of these techs and just getting the experience of, you know, managing these clients, focusing on implementation, whether it's robotics, uh, AI, big data. Um, it, it's it's cool. Right. And eventually maybe I'll come back to blockchain once this thing starts picking up in a, in a couple of years. But um, I'm, I'm super grateful for my time there. There we go. So you're kind of looking for something a little bit more fast paced. And these guys were kind of pumping the brakes a little bit saying, hey, these bigger corporations and banks and financial institutions don't really want to make that move yet. Uh, does it worry you at all that you're seeing some of these huge players kind of pump the brakes a little bit and slow down and not push for adoption the way that a lot of us want them to? No, I mean, listen, in, in an ideal world, um, adoption would have happened uh, back in 2016, 2017. You know, I think, you know, that that uh, Gardner hype curb where you see where technology is sitting, you have like the peak of, um, oh, man, I forget what, it, what all those things are called, but like the, um, you have like a, you believe that the tech is going to change the world. And then a couple of years after that, you're like, oh, all right, well, it has some merits to it, but it's not going to do everything and some. And then like the hype just keeps like, gradually going down a little bit. And that's true with any technology, right? That's the same thing what's going on with like AI right now, uh, quantum computing. Uh, I don't think it's so much as like RPA because there's a lot of benefits that are being seen from that right now. But a lot of technologies, when they first come out, they're promised to change the entire world and do everything and more. And then gradually you, you figure out what those limitations are. And I think that blockchain technology is still so new that people are still tinkering with it. And like I said, until there's... A, a massive security breach, at which we've seen over the past couple of years, right? Like a lot of like these databases are being hacked into, our information is getting stolen into the hands of hackers and like there's nothing we can do about it. So until there's fines that are put on these companies that don't have the right um, controls in place to protect consumers uh, data and they are forced to look at other technologies instead of their ancient ones that they're using right now, uh, blockchain isn't going to going to advance like that. But at the same time, you know, you see some really cool projects that are going on right now. Um, and it's scary, right? Because like during the 2017 uh, ICO craze, you know, it was all about like the use case. That was the buzzword. Like what was, what use case are you trying to solve? Um, and there were some cool ones, right? You know, real estate on the blockchain, like maybe that's a great idea. I don't know. Like, do people really want to like tokenize their assets, like their real estate assets and like sell fractions of that. Like, no, that's a fucking nightmare to try and keep track of. Like, I, I don't think that's like the best use case for it, but like it there's some other great ones. at the time, you know, yeah, it of was, course, it was because everything sounded revolutionary at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was all hype. Right. And then people were so excited about it. It's all new. And there was a new wave of people that got into it. Right. Like you had like all the OGs from back in like 2009, 2010, 2013, whatever. Uh, they've been building, coding, just focusing on, on Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden Ethereum pops out of nowhere and it gives a platform for people to, to build these shit coins. But, you know, try and like build an idea and raise some money consequently um, as a part of that. But there was a new wave of people came in. It's all hype, but like the use case was there, but there's still really cool things going on behind the scenes. And that's, what's been most encouraging to me. Uh, you know, ever since we hit like this bear market in 2018 and the price dropped from 20 K down to three K and now it's been up and down uh, for, and sideways for the past couple of years, people are still continuing to build and the technology is still advancing. So all the groundwork that's being laid right now is just going to pay dividends in the future. So I'm really pumped about that. 
there we go. So you do see this continuing to make leaps and bounds forward. It's just not as quick as we may have hoped. Uh, and kind of, we, we saw that top in 2017, things kind of died off. We've kind of trimmed the fat a little bit. And now stuff that actually does have real life use case is kind of continuing to push on. All the stuff that was kind of just all hype and buzzwords slowly starting to die off. So thanks for giving us a little bit of background on kind of yourself and your past work experience. Uh, can we now get into your podcast? How did that come about? What's that all about? Uh, for my audience who has never heard it or never listened to it, can you just give us the rundown of you know what it is, why you started it, that sort of thing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like like I said, my background is um, I graduated from college um, with an accounting and business degree. I got my master's in tax. I'm very analytical, um, working in securitization. I was all about numbers and you know knowing things for a fact. So um, when I first got into this stuff uh, towards the end of 2016, here, you know, it's what what use case are you trying to solve? Like, what's going on here? Do you have a white paper? And at the time, there really wasn't that much great information out there. Uh, you had to be very careful and you still need to be very careful of like who you listen to online because people are just trying to chill their stuff and make, you know, scam people and make money out of it. So I was like, me and my buddy were like, all right, how are we going to learn about this? So we tried making a blog. Um, and what we would do is like, we tried coming up with like a grading system and, and, you know, analyzing like the hashing, like the network, like how much like hash power does this project have? You know, what's the social score of it? Like how many followers does it have online? Is there a lot of code being contributed on like GitHub? Um, does it have a strong development team behind it? Does it have like a strong founders? Does it have like good board members and all this stuff? And we tried coming up with a scoring system and that was a cool exercise for us because, um, we were reading all these white papers, we were discussing it and we wanted to blog about it, but you know, us both working at like big firms like this and having day jobs that went sometimes from like 9am to 1am. Um, it, it was impossible to keep up with a schedule like that. So I was like, all right, what's the next best um, solution here? And at the time, I think only Laura Shin had like, you know, the, the biggest podcast out. I was like, man, I, I could do this. Like I could talk about this have it edited, like uploaded. Like it's easier to have like a 30, Minute, 30 minute to like 60 minute conversation and upload that instead of like trying to type out this whole blog post and edit it, reread it, like look for grammar mistakes and all this stuff. So I was like, cool, let me get into that. And it was probably like a year after I had that thought that I actually decided to pull the trigger and go on with it. But um, so my podcast, the Do Your Own Research podcast, DYOR, is just a way it was selfish for me because I wanted to learn more about this stuff. I want to have access to talk to some really cool people like John McAfee, Jameson Lop, Andreas Antonopoulos, um, and talk to them directly at the source. So, hey, like, what are you working on? What do you think about this? Because, you know, I'd rather be the dumber guy and asking questions to people that are much smarter than me to educate myself more and provide other people value. Because like I said, going through 2017, there was shit information out there. Everyone was trying to scam everyone else just to make a quick buck, um, you know, disappearing with like hundreds of millions of dollars, like of just stolen funds. Like it was just ridiculous of how many people just got taken advantage of there. So I just wanted to, you know, A, have a platform for me to just learn a little bit more, but more importantly, just give people access to some of these quote unquote, like thought leaders or whatever, or just like really smart people that are in this space that have been thinking about this for years and have cool ideas, how to shape the future of it and are able to talk about what's real, what's really happening, what your expectation should be and what's bullshit. I love it, man. Honestly, we the the more we talk, the more I come to find out we have very similar backgrounds. You know, working in finance, I started the podcast as a way to one learn more about business from people who are kind of leaders in the industry, and then two kind of share that with everyone else on Twitter and you know out there in the world. So it, it's funny that we come from the same background. We've both got a podcast. We both started them for very similar reasons. Uh, and I love what you're doing, and I'm surprised it's taken this long for me to get you on. Uh, I really appreciate you reaching out because, you know, I'm, lo I'm loving what we've got so far. Um, you know, the, the term DYOR, do your own research, gets thrown around a lot. But I, I feel like people still don't really know how to do their own research. Like they think doing their own research is following somebody with 50,000 followers who tweets about altcoins, and that's how they do their research. So I, I guess in your, you, you talked about some of the stuff that you talk about on the podcast, but in, I guess, your own words and simplest terms, 
What does it actually mean to do your own research, especially when you start down the rabbit hole at just Bitcoin? Like what what is doing your own research with regards to Bitcoin? I mean, the first thing for me is like always going to the source. So whether it's with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency is just starting usually with the white paper or some type of like website. And I would say like, like I just said, the source. So like I would go to uh, Bitcoin.org or something like that. I mean, maybe that's not a great example with Roger Fur trying to shill uh, Bitcoin cash or whatever, but, you know, start with the white paper, right? Get an idea of back in like 2008, 2009, what was Satoshi really thinking? What was the purpose of this cryptocurrency? Like, why did he want to build this stuff? And then just go down from there. And it's going to differ for so many people, right? Like everyone's going to have their own methodology and ways about going about it. But to me, DYOR is doing enough um, analysis, right? Instead of just using the word research over and over again, doing analysis so that you can come up with your own conclusion and have conviction about it. Um, because like you said, like it's easy for people to hop on Twitter and they'll see someone like a, a pomp or, um, I don't know, like a McAfee who has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers, right? Oh, wow. Like they must be like knowing what they're talking about. Anything that he says is going to be correct. And let me just listen to what he does. But then, you know, you're investing your own money and they're not liable for any of that. So you can't just say like, you can't point your finger after they shill, um, I don't know, let's just call it ghost coin because that's what McAfee's working on right now, right? He's going to be still in ghost coin because like he's obviously going to have like some skin in the game for that, right? Like he's going to want to pump it out. Yeah, he wants to secure privacy and be anonymous because of his background and stuff like that. But he also wants to make a quick buck off of it as well. So it's understanding like who you're listening to, who your like teachers are going to be online and accepting some of that, sure, but just question everything as well. You know, you have to understand that people have motives to do a lot of things, especially online. And to create a Twitter account, um, it, it costs nothing. As long as you have a cell phone or an internet connection, you could create an account, put an avatar up, and you're good to go. You could buy followers and, you know, you're gonna, you can make yourself like buy likes, buy retweets and stuff like that and pump yourself up and make people uh, create this perception about yourself. But at the end of the day, like me as an individual, I can't listen to um, like the crypto dog or something like that. And I have a lot of respect for him and, and everything, but I can't just, if he says buy now, I'm not going to like go buy. It's like someone telling me to jump off a bridge. Like, am I just going to jump? No. Like, all right. Like, am I going to survive this jump? Like how far down is it? Is, am I going to be freezing my balls off? Like once I get down there, like, no, like that's not going to be good for me. And like, if I make that decision, it's on me and people need to own that, especially when it comes to making your own money and, it's cool to think that someone like um, BitLord, you know, is telling me to buy like all these altcoins. They're going to be pumped up 10 to 100 X and you're going to make a quick money and you're an idiot if you're not doing it. Maybe you will be, but maybe you won't. And if I'm putting my money that I worked really hard on, like hard for on the line, then I need to make sure that I'm comfortable making that decision. So in a long answer short, it's just doing enough analysis so you have conviction whenever you're making some type of financial or, or investment decision. Yeah, you touched on a couple huge things there. Uh, I want to <laughs> just couple. I want to circle back on the Twitter stuff because you're you're so right. Anyone can hop on Twitter. Anyone can create a name for themselves, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they know exactly what they're talking about. I know people who blindly shill coins. A couple people's names got mentioned. Uh, they'll say, you know, I'm buying this coin right now, and that could be true. That might not be true. You don't ever really know. Uh, and then on top of that, you talk about these kind of financial motives that a lot of these guys have. You know, when they're shilling a product or a coin, it usually means that they've got a bag or some sort of financial interest in that specific project. So for them to hop on Twitter and say, hey, this is a great project. I love it because of these reasons. A lot of people don't realize that they're gaining financially from that when other people purchase this product or invest in whatever it is that they're talking about. There's usually some sort of financial gain. Uh, and then also you talked about kind of starting with the white paper. And you mentioned something that I don't hear many people talking about, uh, which is kind of understanding the financial landscape at the time, especially with regards to Bitcoin, because that was right during the financial crash or right after the financial crash. Uh, and so many people are like, oh, yeah, you know, Bitcoin created then uh, it does all this. I read the white paper, um, but they don't really realize what it kind of came out of and what it was aiming to do. And once you kind of look at the financial landscape along with the white paper, 
gives you a very clear idea of what Bitcoin is. Uh, and the same sort of thing can be applied to almost any coin if you read the white paper and then think about kind of the financial landscape at the time you can get a better understanding of what the motive or the goal of the coin is for example you read a lot of white papers you look at okay it was created in 2017 towards the end of 2017 you can kind of realize that like hey this is full of fluff there's a lot of buzzwords in here this was created at the peak of the ico mania maybe this is just kind of uh, money grab people trying to cash in on this ICO craze that was going on uh, so not only reading the white paper kind of looking at the landscape as well and then you talked about some other stuff like looking at the devs uh, I know a lot of people aren't very tech savvy and um, I personally am not myself so when I'm reading through some of this stuff looking at kind of who's working on the team uh, some of it's a little bit over my head do you have any tips for those guys who are not as tech literate, I would say. I'm not tech literate at all, right? Like your best friend is going to be Google in this case. Like to copy someone's name, they're listed in the white paper on the website, whatever it is, Google it. You'll probably be directed to their LinkedIn uh, profile. You'll be directed over to their um, GitHub page or something like that. And quickly you could see if they have experience or if it's just some bum that they just picked up that has a, a pulse off the streets and they're like, hey, you're going to be like our main developer now. Like, no, you could tell if someone has some type of experience and, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to know what they're doing, but that gives me a little bit more comfort than just, you know, a bunch of kids out of college just saying, you know, we're going to build like the, the next great DeFi product that's going to change the entire world. Well, have you even built anything before? Do you even know what you're doing coding? Like maybe you, you made an app or, you know, you made like a, a Shopify website or, or something like that, but like building out like a full system and like an entire blockchain network it's way different than anything like that. So start with Google, you know, just start searching people and, and figuring it out. Like, you know, you don't have to understand all the code, but you, if you go on like a Reddit page or something like that, you'll see a lot of debates going on and people will start calling out like errors in the, in the code. And you don't have to understand all of that stuff, but just try and digest it in such a way that makes sense to you. There we and, go. Yeah. And you know, one thing that I do want to, just want to say is just like we're going to have another wave of this coming up right like i just mentioned DeFi, that's been a buzzword maybe for about a year or so now but once ethereum 2.0 happens and more of these products are coming out we're going to see like the ico ico craze 2.0 in my opinion right whether that actually happens or not i don't know i think it will um i think people are going to have short memories about the ico craze back in 2017 especially ones that weren't in this space at that time so you're going to see a lot more products coming out that's saying that they're going to change the world in Africa. They're going to revolutionize banking in India, or, you know, you're going to be able to make payments with China for zero fees or something like that. I don't know, but you're going to see a lot of this stuff coming out and you really need to be cognizant of it. And you can't just take things at face value. You really need to start digging in a little deeper. Yeah. And I think now is kind of the time to start re researching that stuff. Because once stuff starts popping off, we are seeing 100Xs in 2017, you know, stuff would go up 100X in a week, a month, whatever it was. And people were just throwing research out the window. It was just buy anything, pray that it goes up. For the most part, it would, and you'd make your money. Uh, but if you start doing this now, you'll keep your head, you'll keep your cool, you'll research good projects, you will invest in good projects, and you'll be ready for that next craze. Um, you know, I just want to touch on it one last time. Uh, you know, following these guys on Twitter, it's so easy for someone who's is actually well researched and who's kind of known as an altcoin investor or a crypto investor. It's very easy for you to just be like, "Hey, I can kind of ride their coattails." But even those guys make mistakes, and I think you know, like you were saying, reading the white paper, understanding what their kind of goal is researching the team, seeing if they're related to any projects or they're partnering with any other projects or companies that are well known. Uh, we started to see stuff like Google, Disney, these big, big partnerships. And those can kind of key you in because those guys, you know, they have full teams doing their research on this stuff. So you, you do enough research to where you can be comfortable investing your money it's never going to be a hundred percent that's kind of what investing is there is that risk to it where you could lose your money uh, but taking these precautions along the way will help you from just investing in blatant scams from the get-go 
Um, so love what you're doing with the podcast. Before we move on, uh, do you have any favorite episodes? I know this is a hard question. I've gotten asked it a couple times, uh, and I'm always thrown off by it. But I have to ask, do you have any favorite episodes that you think people should go check out? Um, so, yeah, I, I've had a, a ton of great discussions right now. And um, I think one of my favorite discussions was one that I literally just recorded yesterday uh, with Jason Williams um, from Mortgage Creek Digital, um, Palm Buddy. And we didn't discuss, I mean, we discussed a lot about Bitcoin and, and everything like that. But, you know, coming from a guy who's made $500 million um, off of his first company and just seeing how b- bullish he is with everything and, you know, his thought process on it, um, it, it was really cool. And he gave a lot of no bullshit answers as far as how to build a business, right? Like what it takes to be an entrepreneur and the differences between an entrepreneur, entrepreneur versus an employee. Um, so that was incredible. And I literally just last week, I recorded one with Preston Pish that is coming out as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of his um, when I was commuting into New York City um, back a few years ago, I, I was listening to his podcast and um, just hearing his thought process about it and how he's valuing Bitcoin and his thoughts on the future of it. Uh, not, not only from a, a price perspective, but just like the tech and being uh, a unit of currency. It was eye opening for me. So I would say those two are definitely um, my top two and those will be coming out within the next week or so. All right. Perfect. So anyone who's listening to this has something to look forward to. Uh, And this kind of actually segues really nicely into my next question, which I always like to ask all of my guests. You know, you just had these two conversations with people who are very keyed in doing a lot of research, kind of making this their life and have very good positive outlooks on Bitcoin and the future of crypto. And I always like to ask, you know, what are you most excited for in the coming 12 months? So did those talks spark anything or do you have anything else in your pipeline? What I'm most excited excited for for within like the next few months or so is obviously we just, we just crossed the having event, right? So there was all this hype going on about that, about Bitcoin. And obviously we didn't moon yet. um, But I think the scarcity is slowly going to start creeping up on people. I think they're really going to start recognizing, hey, you know, there are only 21 million of these things. Um, There's probably only about 17 after it's all said and done with people losing them on on different things like that. And adoption is going to happen. And one thing that you touched upon before was like understand understanding the financial landscape of what's going on. When Satoshi first came out with the white paper, right, it's in 2008, 2009, and the economy is a shit show. Fast forward 11 years, like we're no we're different. There again. <laughs> exactly, right? Like, <laughs> you know, right there's, back to it. there's only been like band aids that have been put on like the economy. And now they're saying, let's just keep printing money at nauseum until like, you know, we keep this like thing stable. But that's only screwing like people like me who are working and like, you know, inflation is catching up really quickly. And like my dollar that I earn is not going to be worth it like much very soon. So, I think as all these things just continue to play out and whether we see another recession or something like that, uh, maybe we're in one right now. Uh, I'm not an econo- um, economist, so you know I'm not someone who's able to talk about, about things like that. But whether it's another recession or something like that, there's just so much stuff working in Bitcoin's favor right now. And over the next 12 months, I, I think that all this shit that the Fed has been printing out and central banks have been like trying to cover up is just going to explode and people are going to realize that we need to change. And ultimately, they're going to start trying to figure out what do I do with my money? So it's not just getting you know, worthless like we're seeing in Venezuela with hyperinflation. And ultimately, they're going to stumble upon Bitcoin and they're going to be, you know, they might have called people crazy for thinking about it years ago. But as they start learning a little bit more about it, they start opening their eyes and realizing what's happening around them. They're going to be like, shit. And even if it's just like a little bit, a small scale, if that just keeps happening and happening, like it's going to make a big difference on the uh, the crypto market cap as a whole. Yeah, 100%. Two things you mentioned there. One, I think most people know what Bitcoin is. They've at least heard about it. They may have bought some at one point, sold it after the crash. Uh, so it's in the back of their mind. And the Fed just keeps, like you're saying, putting Band-Aids on this kind of stuff. You know, it's print another trillion, print another trillion after that. Send out $1,200 to everybody. Start buying corporate bonds, which was just recently announced. And it's all this shit that's just, you know, they're they're doing everything they can to prop up the economy uh, as it's kind of going to shit. And, you know, people always say... 
you have to kind of let the market do its thing. You can only prop it up for so long and eventually you're not going to, it's going to be out of your hands. Stuff's going to start to crumble apart or get away with you, on, get away from you on the positive side. Uh, this side, it send, this time, it seems to be more of a negative and we're kind of heading towards a recession or potentially a depression. Uh, and that's when, you know, they've got Bitcoin in the back of their minds inflation starting to run a little bit more rampant and like you're saying how can i kind of protect some of that capital that i've worked so hard for you know you got people who save their entire lives when the stock market starts going to shit and their 401ks get cut in half and their dollar is worth less you know the dollars in their bank account are worth much less than they were a year five ten years ago they're gonna look for new options and we've seen it in Venezuela, like you're saying, other people fled to the U.S. dollar itself. But when a larger currency like the U.S. dollar starts to decline very heavily, Bitcoin is one of the best options for people to turn to. Uh, and a lot of people I know are kind of tuned into economics and how the economy is doing, how stocks are doing, are saying that they're thinking there's going to be a major downturn in the next 12 to 24 months. And that number has been thrown around for the last year or so, but I think it is starting to come to fruition. And like you're saying, I think Bitcoin's going to be a huge safe haven. So very similar mindsets there. Uh, do you have anything personally that you're working on uh, that you want my audience to know about? It's always nice to hear what kind of my guest has going on, not just what they're excited for in general. Yeah, no, honestly, um, I I tweeted out a, um, a few weeks ago about uh, me stop contributing to my 401k just so I could accumulate more Bitcoin. And that's true because like I just switched jobs. Um, so I left EY. I left to go to a smaller consulting firm to have um, a bigger role there and to sharpen up a lot of my skills and work with a variety of different technologies instead of just blockchain. So um, I've been transitioning to that, working on that really hard, uh, learning a lot. It's been a great experience, but um, outside of that, it's just really trying to learn more about people on Twitter um, as an extension of me doing my own research and just continuing to have cool conversations with people like yourself and um, see what, you know, the overall market sentiment is like, what are people doing, thinking about this and having a platform to be able to speak to someone like a Preston Pish, um, someone who I I've looked up to and I think is much smarter than me. And he's done years and years and years of research about the stock market and then seeing like, him so bullish on Bitcoin, it's like, whoa, like there's something to this, right? And like, he's not just um, throwing smoke out of his ass. It's like, he's giving legitimate facts. And it's interesting to see, like he just got into like this massive exchange with Mark Cuban um, and he's defending Bitcoin and Mark really didn't have an answer to him. And I asked him about that and he explained it on my episode and, you know, audience definitely come check it out when, when it's out there. But like, you know, he, he put himself in Cuban shoes and he thought about it and it makes perfect sense why someone like that wouldn't want to see Bitcoin succeed. And that's the same thing with all these things going on there. So um, am I working on any cool projects? No, I'm just trying to keep continuing educating myself and putting out content that I hope is valuable for um, people to listen to. And if I could even just get one person to not make a stupid financial decision and not blow um, their life savings, like that's a huge win for me at the end of the day. Yeah, man. And honestly, I think you've already done that. Uh, we can't be for sure on that one, but I mean, just everything that you've put out, all the research that you've done, all the guests that you've talked to, I really think you have made a positive impact on a lot of people's lives and kind of steered them in the right direction when it comes to investing in Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency industry. So thank you for everything you do. Uh, for anyone who hasn't listened to it already, we're going to have a link to your Twitter as well as the podcast. I highly suggest checking it out. Uh, before we end, I always like to get a kind of biggest tip. Uh, and you just talked about how you want to kind of steer people away from poor investment choices. So I kind of wanted this episode to be on doing your own research. Uh, and the hope is that a couple people who are brand new to the industry find this episode, someone who maybe even has never invested in Bitcoin, right? And uh, I kind of just want to get your biggest tip for those guys who are brand new, maybe haven't bought yet or own a little bit of Bitcoin and are starting to explore more of this industry. What's your biggest tip for those guys? It's just being critical, right? Like not taking things at face value and just trying to read deeper into things. If you see, like we talked about earlier in the episode, like if you see people shilling a coin, 
don't think like, oh yeah, they're trying to help me make money. Think like, hey, do they have a big bag that they're just trying to make a quick buck off off of? And like, they're trying to use their influence to to show this just like for financial gains for themselves. Like you have to realize that people don't have your best interests at heart, especially not over the internet with people they don't even know about. So just be critical and, and make sure that like, just be smart, right? Like, you know, listen to your gut. Like that's not great financial advice or investment advice at all, but usually you could tell like what's a good move or what's not a good move. So listen to your instincts, listen to your gut, um, dig a little bit deeper and be critical about things. Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly think that's one of the best piece of advice, especially for people who are new to Twitter. I harp on this a lot and people just don't seem to understand that I would say every single person online has some sort of ulterior motive. Uh, even myself, you know, I'm trying to get people to listen to my podcast. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about stuff online and I tweet and I make friends with people online, yes, it's, you know, for me having a good time online. But at the end of the day, I am also trying to drive people to my podcast. Uh, and I, for, I think people forget about that. You know, they see, see these kind of talking heads as these people who just want to help the world and share all this information. But at the end of the day, they're usually trying to sell you some sort of product or some sort of investment advice. Uh, and so it is just being extremely critical about it. And I think the people who do it best are the people who provide value, but also kind of sell you on something like you mm -hmm. and I, we both have podcasts. We're trying to get people to listen. We've got people who are trying to get to sponsor it, but at the same time, we're teaching the community about something. So it's a win win. You know, they get the information from the episodes. I get the back end sponsorship. I'm getting paid for it. I get to put out episodes. I get to sit down and talk to you, learn from you. Uh, and so those are the people you should try to look for is there's that win win situation. Whereas some people, they're just saying, hey, I'm going to shill garbage to my followers and I'm going to get paid for it. And you need to make that distinction. So I think that's great investment advice, especially for anyone who's just hopping on any of these social platforms, because that's where a lot of information gets shared. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that was a wonderful way to end it. Uh, I always like to ask if there's anything else that you want my audience to know, anything that you think we missed, anything that you want them to check out, any sort of stuff like that. No, man, uh, this has been a pleasure. And like I said, I'm super grateful to have you on. Uh, for the audience, definitely uh, check out the links. Um, follow me on Twitter at Digital Tom with two underscores. Uh, check out the podcast at DYOR Podcast. Uh, the website's DYORpodcast.com. Um, and give me some feedback, right? Like I'm doing this out of like my own educational purposes, but I'm trying to provide you guys value as well. So if there's anything you want to listen about or something you don't like or anything like that, hit me up in my DMs, you know, tweet at me or something like that. Let me know uh, just so I could do my best to help provide you value. I love it. You've got those two episodes coming out with two huge titans of industry, I would say. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to those. For anyone who's listening to this, again, in the description below, there will be a link to your Twitter as well as your podcast, the website. Uh, so for anyone, please, I highly encourage you to check it out. If you enjoy my show, I'm sure you'll enjoy Tom's. Uh, and again, thank you so much, man. It has been an absolute pe sorry, pleasure talking <laughs> with you. Yeah, man, it, it has been. I, I appreciate it.